Welcome to Electron Online, and here we're going to apply the molecular orbital bond theory, or simply said, molecular orbital theory, to the two periods on the periodic table, the first and the second period, all the elements within them. We're going to look at hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And the theory goes as follows, as we make, as we're aware of the number of electrons available to make the bonds, what kind of bonds are going to be formed? And the bonds usually fall in two categories. They're either sigma bonds or they're pi bonds. Sigma bonds is where the orbitals overlap. You make a bond like that. Pi bonds is where the orbitals fold over and make overlapping bonds this way that are not exactly in the plane of where the molecule is at. It's above and below, below the plane where the sigma bond is, is put together. Also, we understand that with the sigma and the pi bonds, you can either have what we call a bonding pair or an anti-bonding pair. You can either have a situation where the, the electrons are in phase and they make a solid bond and they form a, a force of attraction, or the electrons end up in a situation where they repel each other, and so you have a, an anti-bonding pair, and so that would then drive the atoms apart, prohibiting a molecule from being formed. If the number of bonding pairs equals the number of anti-bonding pairs, you'll have a situation where it's not a very strong bond and the molecule typically can just not exist. So we're going to use that theory to figure out which of these molecules can exist and which ones cannot. And of course, we're going to put the electrons in here in the orbitals as we know them, the 1s, the 2s, and the 2p orbitals, and then we'll see what type of bonds will then form. And from that, using what we call the bond order equation, we're going to figure out whether or not those molecules can exist. So starting out with hydrogen, we realize with hydrogen, we have one electron in the 1s orbital for the one hydrogen and one electron in the 1s orbital for the other hydrogen. So when those two come together, they do indeed form a sigma bond. And therefore, since we have one pair of electrons that are making a sigma bond and we have no electrons in the antibond, we can then, of course, already see that a bond is possible and so the H2 molecule can exist. And so looking at the bond order, this becomes a situation where we have uh, two electrons that are forming a bond pair, zero electrons that form an antibond, divided by two, we get one, and sure enough, that's greater than zero, so therefore, we have an existing molecule. In the shorthand notation like this, we can simply say we have two electrons, they form a sigma 1s bond, and so therefore, yes, that can exist. And we then kind of ignore everything else here because that's not filled, there's no electrons indicated in here. So by putting a little number in there, we indicate how many electrons are in that particular bond pair. Going on to the next element, helium. So we add an additional electron in each of the two s orbitals, so now we have helium. So now that we have four electrons, two end up in here, and two will end up in here. Now notice that the energy goes up as we go up here. So these bonds are in higher and higher energy. It takes more energy to put the electrons in there. Now notice that we have one pair in the, making a bond, one pair making an antibond. They cancel each other out, so we should not see these molecules existing. If we then plug that into our equation right here, we can then see that there's two electrons making a bond pair, two electrons making an anti-bond pair, that's zero divided by two is zero, therefore since the bond order is zero, this electron or this molecule will not exist, so we could just kind of cross it out. Okay, next element, lithium. One electron in the 2s orbital, besides the two that are in the 1s orbital, one over there, so we have two electrons, right? I should say two atoms right here, they bond together. These extra two electrons will end up in the sigma 2s bond, like that. And you can see four electrons make bonds, two electrons make antibonds. The bonds are in greater numbers than the antibonds, so that molecule should exist. So the equation here will look like that. Four electrons uh, minus two electrons, that's two divided by two, which is one. Bond order equal to one, so we have a good one. Lithium like that exists. All right, next element, we go to beryllium. Beryllium has an additional electron in the 2s orbital. So each, uh, each beryllium atom brings in four electrons. That means that the last two end up going in the sigma 2s antibond. Now the electrons that form bonds equal four. The electrons that form antibonds equal four, equal numbers. We would not expect that molecule to exist. So now the bond order equation becomes 4 minus 4 divided by 2 equals 0. And so we do not expect to see a molecule like that.
Okay, next molecule is boron. So boron has, has an um, electron in the p orbitals in addition to the four electrons that are in the s orbitals. Now what's interesting is that the pi bonds that the p orbitals form are lower in energy than the sigma bonds. So the, the electrons in the y and the z p orbitals, they will form bonds first and then the electrons in the x orbitals will form bonds next because the, the pi bonds have lower energy levels than the, um, than the sigma bond. So imagine then we have an electron in here, electron in there, they will then form bonds that look like that. And notice what's interesting is that it'll end up with one electron in each pi bond, which means that we do no longer have a pairing of electrons, which means more electrons are spin in one direction versus the other direction, which makes us a paramagnetic uh, molecule. But notice our these are valid bonds, so these are bond pairs. Here's a bond pair, there's a bond pair. We have six electrons involved in bonding, four electrons involved in antibonding, which means the bonding electrons are there in greater numbers than the antibonding electrons. So we end up with six minus four divided by two, which is one. Bond order is one, so therefore this molecule does exist. Going on to carbon, carbon has an additional electron in the p orbitals like this. Now that causes these to pair up, so it's no longer paramagnetic, it's now di diamagnetic. And diamagnetic simply means that not a lot of effect when a magnetic field is present, where paramagnetic means it does have an effect when a magnetic field is present. Now we see that the number of bonding pair electrons increased to eight. The number of antibond electrons is still four. So now we have a bond order that will be equal to two. So see here, eight electrons forming bonds, four electrons forming antibonds, divided by two is two. Bond order of two means you have a fairly strong uh, bond here, and so that molecule definitely will exist and will have a strong bond. Okay, moving on to nitrogen. Uh, notice that we have an additional electron right here. And uh, now we can see that those two additional electrons will end up in the sigma 2p bond. One in the up, one in the down spin, but again, that, is, that does make a bonding pair. So now we have 10 electrons forming bond pairs and only four electrons forming antibond pairs. So now we have 10. All right, so we have 10 electrons minus four. That's, that's six divided by two, which is three. Now here's a bond order of three, meaning that is a very strong uh, bond, meaning nitrogen in the diatomic state, diatomic nitrogen like that, is put together very strongly, very difficult to break those bonds apart. Matter of fact, it's the nitrogen in the atmosphere that protects us from the, from the, uh, from the uh, very strong rays coming from space because the energy is absorbed by the bond strength of nitrogen because it has a very large bond order. I think the energy required for a mole of nitrogen to break it apart is about 900 kilojoules, which is quite amazing. So you can see it's simply because there's so many more electrons forming bond pairs versus antibond pairs. So definitely diatomic nitrogen is definitely found. Okay, now we go to oxygen. Oxygen will have an additional um, electron in the p orbitals like this, which means now those two ele extra electrons end up in the antibond uh, pi bonds like so. So now the number of antibond electrons, or electrons involved in antibonds, is now six, which causes the bond order to decrease to two. Still plenty big, so therefore diatomic oxygen like that definitely does exist. And of course we know that, that's what we breathe, that's what keeps us alive, that's what makes up about 20% of the atmosphere. Going on to fluorine, we have an additional electron in the oop, it's wrong direction, wrong spin direction here additional electron in the p orbitals like this, which of course they then end up in the pi bonds, the anti-pi bonds I should say. So now we have eight electrons that are involved in anti-bond pairing, like that. So eight subtract from 10 still means that we have a bond order greater than zero. It's one, so definitely that molecule exists as well. And then finally when we get to neon, neon will have an additional electron in the p orbitals. Those two additional electrons will go into anti-sigma bond like this. Now we have 10 electrons involved in anti-bonding versus 10 electrons involved in bonding. The bond order now becomes zero. Zero means that molecule 
does not exist. So neon, we know, is a noble gas. doesn't react with itself to form a diatomic neon gas. So therefore, we can say zero bound order means that molecule does not exist. So pretty good. Now, as far as the, the shorthand notation, when we go to helium, helium has two electrons in antibond pair. So this would form hydrogen. This plus this is the shorthand notation for helium. Then when we get to lithium, we include the 2s bond pair, sigma bond pair. Then we get to beryllium. We put a 2 on there, indicating there's two electrons in the anti-2s sigma bond pair. Then we get to boron. Notice with boron, the first two electrons, one will go in here and one will go in there. So these two together will form boron. And when then carbon comes along, it brings an additional two electrons. So, so instead of a 1, this becomes a 2. And this one becomes a 2. And so then this becomes oxygen. Oh, not oxygen. Wrong one. Carbon. After boron, we have carbon, of course. Then the next element, nitrogen, it brings in two additional uh, electrons. Those two electrons go into the, the sigma 2p bonds. So this would become nitrogen. We put a 2 there. Next element, now we get to oxygen. Oxygen, we'll put one electron there and one electron there. So these two together are the indicators of oxygen. That's not a very good looking O, is it? Mm. Let's do that. Okay, now next we have fluorine. Fluorine will bring two extra electrons. We'll make this a two, and we'll make this a two, and so that then indicates fluorine. And then finally, when we have neon, it brings in the two additional electrons, forms an antibond pair in the 2p sigma antibond, and so this would be neon. And you so you can see that this is a shorthand notation. All we have to do is just keep on adding numbers indicating how many electrons there are in each of the bond pairs and each of the antibond pairs. Of course, technically speaking, when we talk about hydrogen, we should not write any of these other things, just leave them blank and just indicate this. This would be helium, that would be lithium, that would be beryllium, and so forth. And so that's the shorthand notation for the molecular orbital theory. Hopefully that helps you out, and you can see how that theory then helps us predict whether or not certain molecules exist. And that's how that works.